Hi, welcome to Adoption Now, your adoption show. I'm April Fallon. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Adoption Now, your adoption show. I'm your host, April Fallon. Okay, so last week we had Jelana Goebel on, who is an author of No Sugar Coating and A Love Stretched Life. Today we have her back on the show, but she brought her son's birth mother, Jennifer, on the show. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. We're so honored to have you here. Thank you. We get a lot of questions about the relationship between an adoptive mother and the birth mother and what that looks like. And I just love that Jelana has been so open with the highs and the lows of your relationship, but we want to hear from you. We want to know about your story. So let's start with the beginning of your story. You were in foster care. I was. And when were you placed in foster care? I was about nine years old. Okay. And do you have a relationship with your biological family? I do, um, in a sense. Um, my mom and my father have both passed away, but you know, I, I speak to a couple people in the family, but other than that, not really. Did you stay in the foster care system the entire time from nine years old to 18? So that's kind of complicated. Many times I often ran away or they would place me back with my mom, um, then soon to just remove me. But anytime I ran away from a foster home or group home, it was to go back to my mom because I didn't understand exactly why they removed me, um, except for the fact that like stepdad sexually molested me and my sister. And then once I was like 15, they informed me like, hey, your mom's a drug addict. And I'm like, what does that mean? You know, because I thought everything that she, um, she was doing and as well as allowing me to do was normal and that it was her medication because she was an insulin dependent diabetic as well. So at like 17 and a half is when DHS was like, I, I ran away from the last foster home. They were like, okay, we're done. You know, you're so close to 18. There's not much left we can offer you. So, yeah. So then what happened next? I met who I thought was like a love of my life, which is my older two's father. I was 17. He was about 30, 31. On my 18th birthday, I found out that I was nine weeks pregnant with my oldest boy, you know, had him. I was still on drugs. Didn't get him taken from the hospital or anything like that because I was like the master, I thought, of like manipulation and getting away with things. I quit three weeks prior to delivering him. So he came out clean you know, brought him home, didn't stay clean. Then shortly, about eight weeks postpartum, I ended up pregnant with my daughter. I was going to do the same thing before delivering her. That was not executed. She was born two months early. Um, In a sense, I feel like that was like a wake-up call for me, but I didn't get clean right away either. I mean, I did for like four months and then it was like off and running once again when the father got out of jail, which you'll hear multiple times throughout my story. And then I got clean when my daughter was two um, for the very first time in my life. I I consider it the very first time in my life just because it was more than just like a month or two or four months. You know, Um, I stayed clean for nine days shy of five years um, when I had Micah and throughout my pregnancy with Micah. Um, I was clean and sober. I worked through the treatment center that I got clean from, and I remember bringing him home. Like He did great in the hospital, and he would sleep in the hospital, but when I got home, I don't know what changed, but it was like two days after I got home that he would not sleep, and he was just crying, and I remember fiercely sitting in the middle of my bed, holding him as as tight as I could, but not like suffering him to kind of just keep him comfortable and just rock, you know, and that wasn't working. Oh, and by the way, the the younger two's father is separate than the older two's father. I ended up um, calling him um, to say, hey, like I, I need some help staying awake. You know, Um, he was still in his addiction. Um, He just didn't bring it around my house. So you find out when you're a teenager that your mom is a drug addict. How long after did you start using drugs and what drug? Okay, so no, um, I (laughs) I started smoking cigarettes at the age of eight, started smoking pot at nine, 
started drinking alcohol at 10, um, methamphetamines at 13. And these all happened like during the times of like being back with my mom or being on visits or anything like that. It wasn't until I was 15 that I was notified that it was bad, that it wasn't okay to do and that it was drugs. Through all those years, it was never informed to us that like, this is bad. Don't do it. Are you sure you want to do it? Or, you know, don't tell nobody that you do this or anything like that, you know? Um, Yeah. Okay. So you were already using drugs. You just didn't know it was bad. And then once you graduated and you were pregnant or once you left the system, I should say, and you were pregnant, was it methamphetamine? Um, Yes, it was methamphetamines and marijuana at that point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you were trying to get clean and it didn't work out with the children's first father. And so you have a new boyfriend at the time with Micah. Yeah. So who did you call that was back into drugs? Okay. So that was the the younger two's father, Micah's father. Okay. So you call him Mm -hmm. and he's also a drug addict. He is. He was actively using and I knew that I can call him and he would bring it to me. Okay. So how was it all working with your children? Because when you gave birth to your daughter, that's when everybody kind of knew that something was going on and probably social services was involved in some way. Yeah, they were. Um, They met me at the hospital prior to my release. And, you know, we made this overt safety plan of I would not be alone with my son, who was nine months old at the time. And that because I was living with the paternal grandmother, paternal grandma would supervise me during the time that she was home, which was during the day. And then at night when she would leave for work, she would drop me off at a friend's house. And so at that point, I was never unsupervised with my son. And then my daughter was released to me um, three weeks after she was born from the hospital with the same plan of that I wouldn't be unsupervised with her as well. Okay. So then what happened with Micah? With Micah, so I was clean sober for the four years or nine days shy of four, five years, relapsed. I was living in clean and sober housing. And because of my relapse, I was evicted. I moved back in with the older two's grandma. And DHS said, you know, look, stop using or we're going to end up removing your son. And um, about two and a half months later, that's exactly what happened. Um, they came and had an order to remove him. Yeah. And Jennifer That is when Jelana got Micah? No. So Micah ended up in a general applicant home um, for about a week or two. Then he was placed with my aunt, who um, was my very first placement as a child, which he stayed with her until he was about six months old when she reached back out to DHS and said, hey, we can no longer provide for him due to her own personal reasons. And that is when Jelana came into the picture. But you wanted to keep your children. You did not want to place your children for adoption. Yeah. But in the moment of everything, looking back, like I I remember um, knowing that I like I didn't want to stop using. And prior to Micah being removed from me, um, the older two's father came and and took them um, because DHS kind of did the shoulder tap on him saying, hey, look, we're getting ready to remove Micah from her you might want to come get your kids um, before they end up in the system too. And that's exactly what he did. Um, And so. um, Oh, gotcha. Okay. So the two older ones went with their dad mm -hmm. and Micah was kind of hopping around, but finally went to Jelana and then Jelana, let's talk to you really quick. So you pick up this baby and what do they tell you? Um, that the father is incarcerated and that the mother is a meth addict with um, her whereabouts unknown. So did you think you would foster him for a short amount of time or long amount of time? You know, we really didn't know, right? Like I, I think that's where I didn't know, you know, when I first got that call for Micah, it was just like, Hey, we have a six month old baby that needs a foster placement. Like we can't tell you they were up front. Like we can't tell you how long that or short this is going to be. Um, and you know, so, but, so we said yes. And it was just, it wasn't that much longer, maybe like a month or two. Um, when, 
when Jennifer was, was found and, um, and I, you know, got a voicemail from the caseworker on my, on my cell saying, Hey, Jennifer's there. She wants her kid back. Uh, so why don't you come to court? Uh, or you're welcome to come to court. And of course I wanted to go cause I just wanted to, to hear everything myself. And then that's when, as we talked about on the last episode, that's when I introduced myself to Jennifer and handed her that photograph of baby Micah and where she burst into tears and where I was like, okay, I'm rooting for you. And that kind of started our, our relationship. And my, and Jennifer was very, very brave. I have to say, because I wanted to do my own transportation to the office. Um, Little did I know at the time, April, that Jennifer is not only visiting in the same office where she visited with her mother growing up, but oftentimes assigned to the same room. So I know none of this, right? All I know is that, okay, the, the less amount of like stranger faces that this baby sees, the better. And the foster care agency wasn't all that far from my home. So I'll do my own transportation. And that ended up being such a gift because it gave me the opportunity to look Jennifer in the eye every week and to say like, hello, goodbye, to say, you know, some of the milestone first, like, hey, you've never had this to eat before. Like, do you want to feed him this today? Um, And it was really what allowed Jennifer pretty quickly after we, after, you know, a month or so of these kind of interactions um, to say, hey, I grew up with my mom visiting. I grew up with my mom here. I hate it here. This is a pretty uninspiring place to be. Would you, Jelana, supervise visits with me out in the community? To which I was like, I don't know. Can I? So I emailed the caseworker and, um, and she's like, you're either to be on that baby at all times. Um, let me know if Jennifer <laughs> appears under the influence of drugs or alcohol, which you don't say that to like casually to like somebody who like can be very like, I've got to do it like perfectly. I have to do this really well. So, you know, I think I share this when we share our story with caseworkers, but with like a, a head nod and an eye roll to myself. So I went and like essentially checked out every book on meth known to man from the, from, from my county's library and like brought it home. And my husband was like, oh my gosh, like you're a little out of control. And it was never to like try to bust her or have a gotcha moment. It was just that I was wanting to do such a good job. Like this felt like such a big responsibility to like, no, like how would I ever know? And then of course, you know, Jennifer is like, yeah, I was high on a lot of visits. Like I just never even knew. I wouldn't have ever known. <laughs> All the books and honest. you didn't know, right? <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I was kind of like, oh my word. You know, we, we did 150 hours of visits together. There were a lot of ups and downs during that time. And then um, like Jennifer said initially, when the you know, when, when the biological father was incarcerated, she was able to focus on herself and jump through all the hoops and do the services she needed and show up to visits and all those things. And then when he was released, um, he was like a rock that just drowned her like each and every time it was so predictable that the pattern there and, and the agency, um, changed the plan to adoption. And I can still remember, you know, that meeting, you could have heard a pin drop. How old was Micah when you got him? six months old. And how long did you stay in this relationship before you knew he was going to be adoptable? Probably about two years. Two years. So two years you were working Mm -hmm. on helping Jennifer build this relationship because you thought he would go back to her. Mm -hmm. I would say Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong. Like it's like 18 months to two years. Honestly, it's a little fuzzy because we've been journeying together for 13 years now, but that is correct though. Yeah. Okay. So I want to know, Jennifer, when you meet Jelana, did you like her? So for me being just meeting somebody for the first time, I'm a very standoffish kind of person to begin with. I've gotten better over the years. Um, When I first met Jelana and the words of I'm rooting for you kind of broke down a wall, like instantly for myself, that right there told me like she was on my side as much as she could be you know, um, and that she was going to do the best job possible for my son. Now, I never had that growing up in foster care, you know, out of 60 plus placements, I feel like there's probably two households that was a good type of environment, you know, and so I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, it does. Because I think people 
don't always hear the birth mother's side. And so telling an adoption story with both of your voices helps balance out the story. You feel so emotionally connected to to you, Jennifer, because you see the struggle that you've had, right? And that you weren't even taught that drugs were bad. That was a part of your upbringing. I mean, these adults that you were trusting were giving you the drugs and the alcohol. Of course, that would be very, very confusing. And now here it is that you are not able to raise your children that you love. And so it's just such a beautiful picture of understanding what the birth mother goes through and how she really feels about the foster mom. You know, you don't always like her, but in this case, you saw that your son was getting what you didn't get. Correct. And how did that help you build a relationship with her? So through the few times that she would transport um, from her home to the office, instead of having a state employee do it, that allowed me to say, hey, like this woman is trying to put an effort in to, to be there for me and my son. And just to say, hey, I see you, you know, hey, this is what he's done so far. Or, you know, um, include me in the little things of his first things, you know, which kind of just like led me into like opening up and saying, hey, like I, in the moment, it was like, I want to get to know this lady even more. And I don't want to see my son in this dingy office. Like, and so I just, I know that like closed mouths don't get fed. And I reached out and said, hey, can you, are you able you know, and that's when we just asked the DHS worker, you know, which has allowed me to like really get to know her, you know, um, so. and trust her. You trusted her. Yeah. Yes. Because oh, you yeah. believe that she yeah. loved you and cared about you as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you feel when it changed to an adoption plan? Very defeated. Mm. Um, you know, very defeated in the moment. Yet at the same time, like I, in the moment, like I could never, um, especially when I was um, intoxicated on drugs and alcohol, I could never take responsibility for my own actions. You know, most people don't. Um, but now looking back and even just what, eight years ago, looking back, I could say, hey, like Jen, you had a big part in your son getting removed from you. You know, um, they don't just do that for no reason, you know. And um, did you like Jelana? The same when you knew that now she was going to be adopting your son? Yes. You did. Um, I don't feel like... You, your feelings for her did not change. My feelings for her and to her never changed. Um, now, did did I have some moments of like not liking the way things were going down? Yeah, but it was because of my own behavior, not because of anything she was doing. It was hmm. my own stuff, you know? It's great that you can take responsibility for that because that is huge in any relationship that you understand what's really going on, that she didn't come in to take your child, that her, her desire was for reunification and it just didn't work out that way, but it was going to be that she was going to keep an open adoption. How long after did you get pregnant again? Um, so when Micah was they're two two years and five months apart oh okay is to the day yeah I mean I was pregnant during the um adoption process okay and did you think that you would keep that child yes I knew I was going to keep him I knew that um he was going to be my very last child. I had my tubes tied the day after he was born. Um, And in a sense, looking back, I knew he was going to be my way out of that relationship. If that makes any sense. Of what relationship? Uh, With the father. Oh, okay. So this is, this is the father that goes in and out of jail. Correct. Jelana, how did you feel when you found out that she was pregnant? Um, You know, when the plan changed to adoption, April, we actually, I mean, Jennifer and I, it was a little more stilted, I would say a little bit more like formal once the plan changed to adoption, though we were still able to communicate with one another. Um, We actually went out to lunch together. And I think anyone kind of looking at us in the Mexican restaurant where we were like eating together would have thought maybe we were like old pals catching up. But the reality was we did have like 
memories and experiences from which to draw over the last few years together, you know? Um, what she didn't, what Jennifer didn't know at the time is that the agency um, had already kind of shoulder tapped us to be a resource for the baby that was, that she was carrying at that time. But the point of our lunch, which is a kind of an unusual move, right? Once the plan is changed to adoption for the two moms to go out to lunch together. But, um, you know, it, it really wasn't to talk about the case. I mean, that case was our life. It was really to just kind of say, hey, we've been through a lot together and that we're coming up on a changing season um, in terms of like titles changing and all of that. That doesn't necessarily mean that our relationship has to change. Although I knew we had post-mediation adoption agreement coming up and I knew, you know, I was kind of holding my breath for how that was going to go. So Jennifer didn't know that the agency had already said, hey, can you be a resource for this baby that's, that's come in? Um, and, and we just kind of kept the focus on what we'd been through and kind of moving forward, knowing that, you know, I wanted to know like more about like medical history. And I mean, just, just practical things, right. That you're like, okay. And it wasn't that I was anticipating never seeing Jennifer again. So it wasn't like, Hey, I have to get this all in now. But I mean, at that time she was homeless and living in her car and pregnant. And I just, I mean, one never knows. Right. So, um, so did you think you were going to get that baby? Yeah. I, I, uh, I mean, I, if the baby was coming into foster care, unless there was some like huge turnaround and by get the baby, I never thought we would necessarily adopt that baby. Um, I, I meant, you know, foster that baby and, um, make a long story short, we ended up doing it, but he was born in another state. So that took, you know, some, um, that took some extra time, but we fostered him just for a few months, honestly, before he was court ordered to be returned at Jennifer's treatment facility. So, um, okay, Jennifer. Yeah. So when you decided to have the baby, why did you go to a different state? Um, because I wanted to manipulate the system. Um, I figured, okay, my rights got terminated in Oregon. I probably shouldn't have another baby in Oregon. Um, and so I just went right across the state line. Um, and my plan was not executed once again. <laughs> How did they find um, you? Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, I'm sure, you know, states talk or whatnot. Um, I don't know if like just through, I don't know if I ever brought it up with Jelana of like where I was going to have him or anything like that. Um, I don't remember any of that, but, um, yeah. At that time you had relapse. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was still using, um, after losing Micah. Okay. So then they find the child and you get him back in rehab. Yeah. So I ended up going into rehab. He was born de- the end of December. Um, I went into rehab in April. Um, that's how long it took to, um, get a bed. Um, and then I got him back in July of that year. So in the book, Jelana writes about this whole thing in A Love Stretched Life. And it just seemed so interesting the way that she wrote it because she is telling you that she wants to care for the baby, but you are telling her, no, I'm going to fight for this baby. But it didn't seem like between your relationship, you became enemies. And sometimes that happens. How did you not become enemies? I don't know, really. Um, I think I, it was, yeah, I was kind of upset that she was going to get my son, you know, um, but I knew like, okay, she'll get my son from from this lady that has him, who was a general applicant in, in Washington, you know, um, but I knew at the same time, deep down in my heart that she wasn't trying to get him to keep him, you know, she was trying to get him so that he could be with relatives versus some stranger until I could get my stuff together. Um, but like I said prior, like my intent was to get clean, um, for this last baby. Like I, you know, I got my tubes tied. There was no more chances, you know? Um, so that's what I did. Okay. I have to ask Jelana, how did you keep from becoming enemies in your heart? I mean, I think the foundation was laid from the like 18 months to two years that like I was working with Jennifer to try to keep the bond strong between her and her son. I mean, I have to say 
I can't remember if I mentioned this in the last episode or not, but like, this is not an easy road by any means. I felt like I was walking this like jagged tightrope of like, I want the best for this baby. I want the best for this mother. Is this like a, a journey that's going to forge together in the future? Or is this like two mutually exclusive paths? Like, what is this? And just trying to hold that tension, um, you know, landed me in counseling um, to just try to, to try to process this like tangly web of like desire and surrender. And like, what does that mean in this moment? And, you know, Jennifer, we've had some, some, moments where we've just like really said it like it is and and Elias going into staying in foster care in Washington state that was one of those tense phone calls where I was like listen he's either gonna end up with you or with me like we're not gonna let him languish with some random family across the border 15 minutes from here like he's gonna be with you or me so like you decide you only you can decide that and then you know she boarded the bus not, I mean, a bed came available and she boarded the bus and left the father and I returned him to her. Were there tears? Of course there were. Was there some like, oh my gosh, like, how is this going to work? You know, all those, all those questions about future, like, yes. And yet at the same time, I was acutely aware that this was Jennifer's last chance. I really like loved her and cared for her and was rooting for her. Was it like a Oh, you can do it. You're going to make it like kind of like Disney, Disney brand hope, like not at all. It was a very like sober. In fact, I remember on the way to the, I write about this in a love stretch life on the way to the treatment facility to return Elias to Jennifer. I passed this church kiosk with these like marquee letters that were like kind of um, all wobbly and not straight at all. And it just said, as long as there's breath, there's hope. And honestly, I remember like staring out the window, like so weary, just felt like that bone tired weariness, you know, and feeling like, do I really believe that? Or is that just like some Christian-y, like nice thing to say, like as long as there's breath, there's hope. Does that apply to people in their addiction? Does that apply? Like all those things, right? But honestly, I, I honestly feel like even in the tiredness, returning Elias to Jennifer, I couldn't help but still feel despite it all, that there is still a well from which to draw of like the, I'm rooting for you, honestly. Like there was still this, like, I really, in the midst of like staring down reality, I really hope you are able to parent him because I know how much you want it. And to be honest, April, I saw glimpses of the mom that Jennifer could be throughout, you know, now this three plus year journey for your journey. Right. So like, I just, I could see that. And I could see during the times that she really loved her, her children and that she wanted to be a good mom and that she wanted to be present and all these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, the baby was under supervision, obviously at the treatment facility. It was like a lockdown treatment facility, but, uh, my husband, Luke and I, and, and our whole family was there when Jennifer graduated from, from her clean and sober, um, facility. It's amazing. And now it's been six years clean and sober. And we're all just so proud of you, Jennifer. Thank you. I, I I guess saying enemies, how did you not become enemies maybe is the wrong way to phrase that. But I do think that there are times when you are protective of the child and that protection blinds your view from loving the birth family, right? When you come in, I'm speaking as a foster parent or as an adoptive parent. And so you tend to not want to work with the birth family because you want to protect the child from drugs, alcohol, or going from home to home. But you really stood in that place of, nope, I'm in this for everyone involved. And you didn't let your emotions kind of take over. And that's what I really love about the story is that there is, like you said, a well to draw from. There is a place where you can not switch over to completely protecting the child. You have to set those obviously boundaries in place, but you wanted to continue to love her, do what you said you would do and support her and be rooting for her. And that has been a consistent thing in her life. And she had never had that before. So this story is absolutely amazing. And I thank both of you for coming on and sharing it, especially you, Jennifer, you were just so raw and honest. And I appreciate just 
how how honest you were about your journey and just being vulnerable with taking ownership in some of these things that I hear a lot of people don't always do or don't have the strength to do. So that's so amazing. Thank you. And I just kind of want to add that like through the, the relationship of me and Jelana and um, her biological family, I've like learned how to like set the boundaries and um, be able to keep promises and all those little things that most people are like, Oh, you don't know how to do all that stuff. Well, no, like growing up, I was never taught how to do all that, you know, Um, which has led me to like my success today. So yeah. That's amazing. Okay. How can people get this book? People can get a love stretch life wherever books are sold. It is featured on Amazon and Walmart. Target, Barnes and Noble, pretty much anywhere. Thank you so much, Jelana and Jennifer. Thank you for having us on, April. It was really great to just have a chance to share a snippet of our story. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for listening. We'd love for you to subscribe to our weekly podcast and follow us on social media. Thanks for joining us on your adoption show. See you next week. <laughs>